Hello, welcome back everybody. Um, so this lecture is going to cover our chapter two material, which is atoms, molecules, and life. So it's basically a very quick and dirty um, basic chemistry um, discussion, which will tie into chapter three, which is focusing on organic molecules. So this one, we're just getting the basis down of uh, atoms, um, and then we'll kind of see how that progresses into more biological, uh, biologically focused molecules. So this opening picture is showing an ice skater and a lizard that can kind of run on the surface of water. So by the end of the lecture today, we'll be able to see the connection between some of these unique characteristics of water that allows both the ice skater to skate on the ice and the lizard to kind of run on the surface of the water. Okay, so if you remember from last time, we talked a lot uh, or talked a little bit about those levels of biological organization. At the very bottom um, list, was atoms so the atomic level of all living things are based on this atomic this, these atoms so what is an atom uh, so <clears throat> they are the fundamental structure uh, structural units of matter and are composed of three types of particles so we're going to focus on just these three subatomic particles they are protons neutrons and electrons so if you take a look at the picture on the screen, you can see there's a region in the middle of the atom called the nucleus. Now we learned about nucleus last time, but that was in the context of a cell. Nucleus in general just means centrally located, kind of the core of something. So the nucleus of the cell um, is the core of the cell where it holds all the DNA. The nucleus of the atom is the core of the atom. And it holds two of those subatomic particles, the protons and the neutrons. Um, and then orbiting or kind of floating in space around the nucleus uh, is the third uh, subatomic particle called electrons. Um, now, when we take a look at some of these characteristics, one of the things that we could classify or give characteristics to these subatomic particles is their electric charge. Protons are positively charged. They've got a plus one charge. Uh, electrons are negatively charged. They have a negative one charge. Um, and neutrons are neutral, hence the name, so they don't have any charge at all. So protons carry a positive charge, electrons carry negative charge. So if you have the same amount of protons and electrons, they, those opposite charges cancel each other out. Um, and also, positive and negative charges in atoms and molecules attract each other. So think opposites attract, okay? So opposite charges will attract each other. So here in this picture, we have two atoms. Um, illustrated, we have hydrogen, which is the simplest atom uh, that we know of. It has one proton in the nucleus, it doesn't even have a neutron, and one electron orbiting around that nucleus. Uh, the next biggest uh, atom is called helium. Helium has two protons in the nucleus and two neutrons with two electrons orbiting around it. So that's the general, very basic structure of an atom protons and neutrons in the nucleus, electrons orbiting around. Okay, so you may have seen this before. This is a table of information called the Periodic Table of Elements. Um, it has a lot of useful information in it, um, but on first glance, basically, it's just an organizational chart of uh, abbreviations of elements, um, which are the atoms um, are the things that make up elements. Um, a good way to think about an element is um, if we find gold here. So let me see if I can use my pen. So gold is element number uh, 79. Its abbreviation is AU for an old fashioned term for gold. That's why it's not GO or anything like that. Um, so if you have a big hunk of gold, it's 100% gold, it's the element of gold. If you're to break that down, you'd have two chunks of gold. If you're to break that down even further, you just have smaller and smaller chunks of gold and that's still an elemental gold. If you break it all the way down to its smallest characteristic that still holds all of those characteristics of gold, you'd have one gold atom. If you break that gold atom down, you just have protons, neutrons, and electrons and it no longer has that characteristic um, of gold. So elements and atoms are kind of related that way. <clears throat> I might um, show you bits and pieces of this uh, periodic table again, but in reality, for our biological um, discussions, we're really only gonna be dealing with a few of these atoms. We're gonna focus with carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. 
for the most part. Those are the four most common atoms found in living things. Um, we may also see sodium and chlorine come around um, when we are doing some discussions on chemical bonding. So don't be intimidated or overwhelmed by this periodic table. Um, this is not a chemistry course. So we're just gonna be focusing on the atoms um, that we are going to be seeing in these biological molecules, primarily that we're gonna be seeing in chapter three coming up next, next time. <clears throat> okay, so all of these um, atoms or pictures in the periodic table, they kind of had these characteristics. So I wanted to go through what all the information that you can get from these individual um, boxes with letters. So each element uh, is assigned a number and this is called the atomic number. The atomic number stands for or represents how many protons are in that atom's nucleus. So I've written that there, atomic number equals the number of protons in the nucleus. Um, then you have the elemental symbol. It's just a letter abbreviation for the elemental name. And then you have the whole elemental name. So this is hydrogen. And then we have what's called the atomic weight or sometimes called the atomic mass. So this is the sum or the addition of the protons and the neutrons. Now, if you remember two slides ago, hydrogen just has one proton in its nucleus. It doesn't have a neutron. So it weighs one atomic unit, which is the weight of one proton. So if you're to go back and look at the periodic table, you'll see all of this information presented for each box representing one element. Okay, so here's a table. Um, I got my book out here to make sure I'm following along. So this is table 2.1. So this is in your text. It lists the most common elements in living things. So like I said, these four right here, let me get my pen going again. These four right here make up about 96% um, of all um, molecules in the body. They show the percent by human weight. That's not the percent I'm talking about, 60, 70, 80. It might be kind of close. Um, but carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen um, are going to be the atoms that you're going to be seeing most often. Um, calcium is important in bones, phosphorus is important in bones, potassium is important for how your membranes communicate to each other. We'll see sodium and chlorine in the context of salt, like sodium chloride, which is table salt. Um, so those are, again, those are the key uh, atoms that we'll be seeing in our conversations about these, the chemistry. Um, so here's the atomic number. So remember, atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus. And the atomic mass is the number of protons and neutrons, the sum of those two things that have weight um, in the nucleus. Okay, so uh, when you take a look at those atomic mass numbers, you'll notice that some of them are decimals. So um, let's see if I can find the picture here in the book. I can't backtrack on my PowerPoints. Um, there's no periodic table in the book. So, uh, for example, that hydrogen was 1.008 or something like that. It wasn't exactly one, which means, well, if it only has one proton in the nucleus, where does that 0 0.008 come from? Why is it more than just one atomic mass unit? Well, uh, those decimal places in the atomic masses deal with um, what are known as isotopes. So isotopes are atoms, just like all the other atoms on the periodic table, but they differ in their number of um, neutrons. So the protons don't change because a proton is the identity of the atom. So carbon, you know, um, carbon has six protons. Uh, it will always ever have six protons. That's its name tag is carbon six protons. That's what it is. Most carbon that we find is called carbon 12, which we can see here right there. So carbon-12 is so-called carbon-12 because it has six protons and six neutrons. So it has a mass weight of 12. And it's going to have the six electrons around the outside. Carbon-14, on the other hand, is going to have six protons, but it's going to have eight neutrons. So if you add six plus eight, you get 14. Now, it's still carbon because it has six protons. That's its name tag. You can't change that. Um, but it's a little bit heavier. It's got more mass because it has two extra neutrons. And so when we take a look at that atomic mass number, it's basically the um, estimation, the estimate of if you're to take all of the atoms, both um, 
your normal, if you will, or these isotopes that have different numbers of neutrons, if you take all of those and find the average mass, that gives you that atomic mass that's represented on the periodic table. So for hydrogen, here is your normal hydrogen is the H1. Um, so it's got one proton and one electron. That's our normal hydrogen. Um, but if you add a neutron to that, it's a little bit heavier. And so that is called deuterium. And then you can add an extra neutron. So you now have two neutrons in the nucleus. This is called tritium. So there's not as many deuterium and tritium molecules or atoms out there in the universe. And so the majority of hydrogens are gonna be of that H1 form. So that's why the number is really, really close to one which is a 0.1.008 or whatever that number was. So that decimal is accounting for the few of those heavier isotopes that are found um, out there in nature. Carbon-12 is the majority um, isotope for carbon, the carbon atom. And carbon-14 is um, less common. And this is carbon-14 that is used in radiocarbon dating. So when you hear of things that are dated very uh, old, um, like bones or fossils or rocks and things like that, they're using the quantity or the amount of that carbon-14 um, in that particular substance. And they can use some mathematical calculations and analyze how long ago it was that that amount of carbon-14 was in our environment, in our atmosphere. Um, some isotopes are radioactive and they can use, uh, be used in research and for medical purposes. So here I have a picture of uh, some hands, kind of an imagery of hands where the person, um, the left hand was injected with this radioisotope, which could be picked up by these different imaging um, techniques and um, machines. And so you can label, radioactively label certain things in your body because the atoms are going to behave the exact same way, whether they are an isotope or the normal version, if you will. The protons stay the same, the electrons stay the same, the only thing that's different is a neutron. And sometimes those extra neutrons give an isotope some radioactive properties. So you can actually image it with certain uh, like x-rays or MRIs um, or PET scans. Okay, so what about that third subatomic particle? So we know protons give the uh, atom its identity. Neutrons kind of give it its mass and maybe some radioactive Part, uh, properties if it's an isotope. So what do the electrons do? Well, the electrons, um, negatively charged, they have very little mass, um, not really counted for our purposes. Um, but what they do is they actually do all the reactions. They are on the out, outermost edge, if you will, of the atom. And so they are what are responsible for the reactivity um, of the atom, whether it's gonna bond or have reactions with other atoms. atoms. So when we start putting these electrons kind of around the nucleus, um, they go in a very special way. We're just going to do the very basic understanding. Um, but we, we call these electron shells. So the ver there's the very first shell that goes around the nucleus. That this can hold two electrons. So hydrogen and helium will be filling those two, that first shell with their one electron for hydrogen, two electrons for helium. And then you go to the next uh, element, which is lithium. And so that's we have three um, electrons then in lithium, so we have to add another shell, another layer, if you will, to add that third electron and so forth and so on. So here we can see in um, this example, here's carbon. So carbon has six electrons. So we, we start by filling the inner shell first. So we have two electrons in the innermost shell, right? Six minus two, so we have four more electrons to place. So then they just get popped around um, the outside in that next shell. Oxygen has eight electrons. So again, we fill that middle shell. So here's oxygen. So it has two electrons in that inner shell because that's all it can hold. And then we have to add those six more electrons, the remaining electrons, so that goes to the outermost shell and so forth and so on. So you can see how um, those electrons kind of, as the atoms get bigger and bigger with more protons and neutrons, we can have bigger and bigger shells of the electrons. Uh, the biggest one that my head is kind of cutting off uh, is representing calcium. So calcium, I believe, has 20 um, protons, 20 electrons. So you can go through and count. You can find this picture, um, since my head's cutting it off, is on page 21 
uh, if you're in the new edition of the text. So you can see we have two electrons and then eight electrons and then eight electrons and then two electrons fill that outermost shell. And that outermost shell is really, really important for bonding and for chemistry. Okay, um, so when we are talking about these electrons in these uh, shells, hold on, I have a cat coming. You want to see my kitty? Here we go. Say hi. Here's my kitty. She wants to walk on the keyboard, so I got to grab her so she doesn't pause and mess up my video. There we go. Um, all right, so the Nucleus kind of gives stability. So those positively charged protons and the, the weighting neutrons and the weight of the protons, they give the nucleus stability. And then the electrons are what form the bonds. Like I said, they give the reactivity um, of the actual atom. So some of the things that uh, electrons can do, which is very important for biological processes in the cell, is they can absorb energy. Um, it could be heat energy, it could be light energy, it could be, you know, different forms of energy, so that energy can take that electron, excite it, like it can it absorb that energy, it kind of can pop up to one of those outer shells um, that might have other electrons in it, so now they're kind of crammed in there, and that's not super cozy for that electron, so then what it does is it wants to go back to its stable attraction layer at that shell that it belongs to, and when it does that, it releases some of that energy, and it releases it in the form of heat and sometimes light. Um, and so when we see reactions happen that give off heat and light, what we're actually seeing is a result of these electrons taking up energy, bumping up to a higher energy shell, and then falling back to their more stable energy shell, and we give off light and heat um, as a result of that. So then when we take a look at um, the actual reactions, how do these atoms make bonds with other things? Because we know there's that molecular level, that sec second level of biological organization. Everything's just not individual atoms. So what's going on? So of all of those electrons, we have that inner shell that can hold two, and then the next shell can hold eight, and the next shell can hold, hold eight. Um, that's a very special characteristic of atoms. I don't know the, the reason why. I, I didn't take a lot, ton of chemistry in school, and some of it I did. I didn't really remember all of it. Um, but I do remember the reason why atoms like to form bonds and make these larger molecules is they want to fill that outermost shell with the proper number of electrons. And other than that inner shell, which can only hold two, all the other shells, no matter how big your atom is, they want to hold eight. They want to have eight in their outermost shell. So this outermost shell has a special name. It's called the valence shell. Um, and so if you are an atom that holds eight electrons in your valence shell, you are happy. You know, we can't give atoms, you know, emotions. Um, they're stable. They're non-reactive. They, they have filled their valence shell. Um, and so they typically don't form bonds with anything. Um, but if you are an atom that you are, uh, you do not have eight, anywhere from one to seven uh, electrons in your valence shell, then you're trying to go around and trying to fulfill that requirement to get eight uh, electrons in your valence shell. So what we have here, I think this is, oh gosh, I got that picture off of um, Google. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Um, so that might be argon, I'm not sure. Um, but it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In that blue ring, it has eight electrons in its valence shell, so it's happy. It is um, unreactive, it's inert. Now, I said I was going to show you little pieces of the periodic table. So here on the right-hand side, this is just um, a little snippet of some of I, I kind of shaded out the atoms that we're not really going to be focusing on, leaving some of the biologically important ones um, still yellow. But what you're seeing, these little dots here, these are representing the valence electrons. Okay. So hydrogen... It only has one electron. So in that inner ring that it can only hold two, it's got one valence electron. Helium has two. So here's our helium. So those little two dots are showing that it's got two electrons in its valence shell. And since that is its valence shell, helium is inert. It's unreactive. It is satisfied. It's got its valence shell filled. Everybody else shown on this diagram, all the yellow ones, um, don't have 
filled valence shell. So lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sodium, magnesium, chlorine, potassium, calcium, again, kind of these common organic um, atoms that are found in organic molecules. But what I want you to do um, is kind of take a look at the columns, the, the vertical groups, and you can kind of take a look at these shaded ones. I made them not completely opaque because I wanted you to see some of the similarities here in these vertical groups. So if we take a look at this first column, the one that has hydrogen, if you'll notice, how many valence electrons do they have? They all have the same one dot, right? So even though they might have different shells, different numbers of shells, because the atoms are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, they share that common theme of having one valence electron. So hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, they all have one electron in their valence shell. If we take a look at this column, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, how many electrons do they have in their valence shell? Well, count the dots. They all have two. So we're adding electrons as we go across the horizontal row. Boron has three, and we can see aluminum, and I don't know what GA is. Carbon has four. Silicone has four. Nitrogen has five. Phosphorus has five. Oxygen has six. Silicone has six or sulfur, sorry. Fluorine has seven, chlorine has seven. So what's kind of cool about that periodic table is if you look in the vertical columns, these are called groups, it gives you a clue. You don't even have to know anything about the atom itself. Um, it tells you how many valence electrons it has, which gives you clues as to what kind of reactivity and bonds that it can form. So this will kind of all come back when we take a look at our different types of bonding. So, uh, the valence shell electrons what atoms are trying to do when they make bonds is to fulfill that shell um, other than hydrogen and helium which are satisfied with two everybody else is looking for that uh rule it's called the rule of eights or the octet rule they want that outermost valence shell to have eight in it and so they just go around and find different ways that they can do that and that's chemical bonding Okay, so if we take a look, so here's that chart again, kind of unshaded. Um, I've given you the picture of neon. So neon is representing one of those elements that are unreactive. So neon is number 10, atomic number 10. So it's got 10 protons, 10 neutrons, and 10 electrons. So if we go in and we fill in those electrons, we have one, two, that's the inner shell that can only hold two. Then we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, all right? And if we count what's in just that outermost shell, we will get eight. And so neon with its eight electrons is full, it is non-reactive. And if you take a look at this group here, I think I put a circle around it, here we go. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, they all have eight electrons in their valence shell. This group is sometimes called the noble gases. Um, or they are the inert gases because they don't they don't react with anything. So other than helium, because it's in that first shell which only holds two, all these other noble gases are fulfilled. And so they don't they're not going around trying to find anybody to share or steal electrons from because they already have have it full. So all the other atoms uh, and the rest of the periodic table are reactive. They're wanting to fill that valence shell. That's their goal. And so there's a couple different ways that they can do that. Okay, and so they do that by forming bonds. So there's a couple different types of bonds that we're gonna be taking a look at. Primarily ionic bonds and covalent bonds are where, or, uh, I keep wanting to say organisms, where atoms are wanting to fulfill that valence shell. Um, we will be talking about hydrogen bonds, but that's, it's, a, it's more of an attraction. It's not a true chemical bond. Um, we're not sharing electrons, we're not stealing electrons. It's just more of an attraction between different charged particles. Um, so we will uh, dive deeper into each one of these bonds. So you can see this table um, also in your book. Um, let's see. Page 23, if you're looking in the new edition, Ta uh, table two, three. Okay, so let's take a look at these ionic bonds. So uh, the most common example is going to be um, the reaction between sodium and chlorine. 
Okay, sorry, I had to pause. Kitty was trying to step on my keyboard. All right, <clears throat> so if we take a look at the electron configuration of sodium, so we take a look at sodium, it is atomic number uh, 11, so it's got 11 protons, 11 neutrons, and 11 electrons. So if we place those electrons around in those orbits, we have two in that first shell, which that's all it can hold, eight in the second shell, so that's eight, <clears throat> nine, 10, but it has 11 electrons. So we have to add that third shell to place that one extra electron, and that is now its valence shell. All right, so that's sodium. Now, if we take a look at chlorine, chlorine was over on the far right-hand side um, with the, all of the other atoms that had seven electrons in their valence shell. So uh, chlorine is atomic number 17. So it has 17 protons, 17 neutrons, and 17 electrons. So if we count those, we have two in the middle shell, or sorry, in the innermost uh, shell. We have eight uh, in the next shell, and then we have seven in its valence shell in that outermost shell. All right, so here we have sodium on one hand that has one electron in its valence shell, and here we have chlorine on the other hand that has seven in its valence shell. So now remember, how, where are we trying to get to? So the valence shell wants to have how many electrons? Eight, right? So if you are sodium, there's a couple things you can do. You could try to go around and steal seven more electrons from somebody to fill in that valence shell, which is very unlikely and is not going to happen. Or, or um, you can just kick off that outermost electron and revert back to that next level, which would then have eight electrons in it. That would become your new valence shell. So then you can give up that one electron, which is furthest away from the nucleus anyways. So it has the least attraction to that positive nucleus. And so that's what happens. So, so when sodium comes into contact with uh, chlorine or even just sitting in water, that's what it does, it ionizes. Um, an ion is a charged atom. It's, it's carrying either a positive or a negative charge. So when it loses that electron, we still have 11 protons because that's the identity, that's the name tag of sodium. So we have 11 electrons, but now we only have 10, sorry, let me back up. It's got 11 protons, but now we have uh, only 10 electrons. So if you have 11 positive charges and only 10 negative charges, because we've just kicked out that extra electron, um, you have an ion of plus one charge. Okay? So we can see that over here is sodium ions are plus one charge. Okay. Well, where does that ion, where does that uh, electron go? This doesn't float around in the cell because that's doesn't that's not what electrons do. It has to go somewhere. So then if chlorine's close by, chlorine again has seven electrons in its valence shell. It could do a couple things. It could get rid of those seven to revert back like sodium did, but that's not likely going to happen. It's easier for it to take sodium's electron. So it has seven, it can take one more and have eight in its valence shell. So then it's going to be filled. And so when that happens, remember it's number 17, it's got 17 protons, 17 electrons in a neutral atom. When it takes that other electron, it now has 17 protons and 18 electrons. I think there's a typo here. I just noticed it. This is supposed to say electrons, not neutrons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm, good catch. It's fixed in the new edition. This is from a, the 11th edition um, resources. So hopefully that's fixed. Um, that is fixed in the 12th edition. All right, anyways, so sodium ion is a positive charged ion, has 11 protons, 10 electrons. Chlorine picked up that extra electron. It has 17 protons and now 18 electrons. And so we have 17 positive charges, but 18 negative charges. So it takes on a charge of negative one. So these are now called ions. When you have ions of opposite charges, they attract, right? And we say that opposites attract electrons to protons and whole charge ions attract two whole charge ions. So that's these little kind of squiggly lines in here. So this is what we call an ionic bond. So when we take a look at that um, kind of green and purple picture down there in the corner, what we're seeing is these oppositely charged ions, the positive sodium is closely bound to that negatively charged chlorine, and this gives us sodium chloride. 
which is a table salt. So there's right next to it is a picture of table salt. So uh, that is an ionic bond where you actually lose an electron producing a positively charged ion and something else gains that electron producing a negatively charged ion and then those oppositely charged ions attract. So those are called ionic bonds. And everybody's happy because they have fulfilled their octet. Okay, on to the next type of bonds. These are called covalent bonds. So co means like to share and valent means valence electrons. So you can might guess what's happening for these atoms uh, or these uh, atoms to fulfill their valence shell is they actually share electrons. So here we have an example of hydrogen. So right, hi hydrogen was one proton and one electron, but it's got that innermost shell. It wants two, that's it's maybe duplet, we'll call it that, that's not a real chemistry term, I made that up. Um, but what it's trying to do is fill that shell with two. So it's in the hunt for one more electron. So if it comes close to another hydrogen that's on that same search for another electron, what they'll do is they'll actually share each other's electrons and that those shared electrons kind of count um, for that fulfilling of that um, valence shell. So in the hydrogen bonded molecule, so the two hydrogens bonded um, those shared electrons are a very strong bond. So this is what we call a covalent bond. Um, so I wrote down, or I have another picture down here showing a carbon bond. So this is carbon, carbon. It's a single bond because we're sharing just two electrons, one pair of electrons. So carbon um, has six electrons. So it's got two in the inner shell, four in the outer shell. So if we count all of the electrons needed, um, or that can be bonded, we can see that carbon actually can make four bonds because it's got four free electrons. We'll see that here in a little bit, especially in chapter three. Um, so right now, carbon is sharing an electron with another carbon. It's not fully satisfied. It's only satisfied one, two, three, four, five. It's still looking for three more electrons to share. Um, we'll see how carbon does that here in a little bit. Okay, so when we take a look at those um, major atoms that we see in or, uh, biological molecules, right? Heart, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. They're showing phosphorus and sulfur um, because those are gonna show up a little bit later. Um, that This first column here is capacity of the outer shell. So that's uh, how many it can hold, right? So we had that first shell for hydrogen and helium can hold two. Um, everybody else that out, the outer valence shell wants to hold eight. Okay, so we can see that in that column. Now in the actual atom, so in the second column here, it is the electrons in the outer shell. So hydrogen, one electron, it's only got one in the outer shell. Carbon has six electrons, two go in that first shell, so that leaves four in that outermost shell. Nitrogen has five, oxygen has six, phosphorus has five, sulfur has six. So again, you can go back um, to those, peri those periods, the groups, if you will, those vertical, vertical columns, and those are gonna be your clues. So group one has one valence shell, group two has two valence shell electrons, group three has three valence shell. Group, so carbon falls into the group four of that um, vertical column because there's four uh, electrons in its valence shell. And then this next column is how many covalent bonds can that atom make based on those available co uh, valence shell electrons? And if you'll notice, they're pretty similar um, to how many electrons or the combination of those electrons to get you up to eight total. So uh, carbon has four valence shell electrons. It needs four bonds. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. It needs three electrons so it can make three bonds. Oxygen has six in its valence shell. It needs two to reach that number of eight. So hopefully you're seeing kind of that mathematical relationship there. And then this last column is just showing you a pictorial representation of how some of these atoms actually make those bonds. Because um, a lot of times we'll see these letters or circles with these dark lines in between them. Those are representing the covalent bonds. So we can see hydrogen can only make one bond, right? So there's one bond and it's showing one kind of black line. So that's what that single black line is representing. Carbon can do four. So here's this first one, a kind of a, a bond going in each of the four directions. So there's one, two, three, four, right? Because it can do four bonds. Um, here we can do double bonds. So sometimes you might have carbon sharing 
four electrons. It's two plus the two that it's sharing with somebody else. So you can have uh, two single bonds and two double bonds, but we still have four lines. One, two, let's see, one, two, three, four. Um, or we can do two double bonds. So in this picture here, we have one, two, three, four. Or here we can have a single and a, even a triple bond. So we have one, two, three, four. No matter how you draw it, carbon can make, make four bonds. And that's going to be really important when we get into chapter three. Uh, we can see the different ways nitrogen can make three single bonds, a single and two doubles, or three triples. Oxygen can make two singles or one double. Phosphorus can make five. So it can make three singles and a double. Sulfur can make two singles. Hopefully that it kind of sounds like I'm scooping ice cream, um, but it's just it's just taking a look at how many um, bonds can these atoms make based on those valence electrons. They're just trying to fill that octet rule. Okay, so with covalent bonds, there are a couple different types of covalent bonds, right? We got to make it a little bit more in depth, a little bit more complicated for kind of these your the new biology students that you are. So. Beyond just sharing these electrons, sometimes there's relationships between these atoms where they don't share equally. So they didn't go to kindergarten. They like hog all the electric, electric negative charge of the electrons. They don't evenly share between the two um, nuclei of the atoms involved in that bond. So here we have a uh, kind of a summary showing you ionic bonds. So that was a total transfer of electrons. So we have a positively charged ion Right here is attracted to a negatively charged ion here. That's just the opposites attract bond. What we just learned is this nonpolar covalent bond, equally shared electrons. So the blue blobs are representing the negative charge of the electrons are kind of orbiting around the two nuclei. So we can imagine the the kind of the nucleus in here, right? And then all of this is kind of the electron, the negative electrons floating around out here. And they're shared evenly between those two nuclei. But if we take a look at this middle picture, sometimes you might have a nucleus that has a stronger affinity, a stronger pull and attractive force. Its nucleus likes electrons more than the other one that it's sharing electrons with. So what we end up with is an unequal distribution of those that electric charge. So more of the electrons hover around this atom's nucleus. And over here, it's just kind of left out in the cold a little bit. It's, it's still, they're technically sharing. They're just not sharing equally. When you have equal sharing, it's called nonpolar. That's the bottom picture, nonpolar covalent bonds. When you have unequal sharing where one atom hogs some of that electrical uh, negative charge, then that's called a polar covalent bond. Okay? So let's take a closer look. So here are uh, a hydrogen molecule, H2. So it's got two hydrogen atoms bonded together. Um, the hydrogen nuclei are equally uh, attractive to the negative charges. You don't have a... Um, in proportionate distribution of the electric charges. So each nucleus is equally sharing the electron. So this is a nonpolar covalent bond. Take a look at water. Water is two hydrogens bonded with one oxygen. So remember oxygen uh, needed, it could make two bonds. It had that two bonding capacity. So that was uh, in the table on page 24. So what it can do is it can share electrons with two hydrogens, and each hydrogen can make one bond, right? So that was its valence shell. So what we have here is the hydrogens and uh, the electrons of the oxygen are being shared, and the electrons of this hydrogen and the oxygen are being shared. But the thing is, the oxygen nucleus has a stronger affinity, a stronger pull for those shared electrons than that dinky little hydrogen. It only has one proton. The oxygen has eight, right? I think it's number eight, yeah. Um, the oxygen has eight protons in its nucleus. So that's a stronger positive pull. And so what happens are these electrons that are shared, that pair here and that pair here, they tend to spend more time hovering around the oxygen part of that molecule and less time around the hydrogen. So what we end up with is one side of the molecule is partially negative. It's called a partial charge. They're calling it slightly positive. 
the other side of the molecule has a partial positive charge because it's just the protons hanging out on that end. And now it's the protons, but with two extra electrons hanging out on that end. And so this is what we call a polar covalent bond when it's unequal sharing. And then we end up with a polar molecule that has a partial positive and a partial negative side that's gonna come into those hydrogen bonds that we're gonna see here uh, coming up next. Before we get to hydrogen bonds, um, we have to talk a little bit about free radicals. So all of this talk about bonding, everybody's trying to make their octet and everybody's happily sharing electrons. That's not always the case. Sometimes you have molecules and atoms out there that have not bonded um, or filled their octet. And so they are what's called free radicals. They have one or more unpaired electrons in their outermost shell. So they're kind of actively going around searching. And what they can do is they can actually steal electrons away from stable molecules. Um, and that can damage molecules, which can have larger effects on the cell itself and cause cell death. Um, a lot of times, uh, here you can see here, listed free radicals are involved in heart disease, Alzheimer's, cancer, aging, and I have the close-up picture of wrinkles, right? Um, so effects of aging and sun exposure can increase your amount of free radicals, um, which can affect the health of your cells and the health of your overall body. So what do we do to fight free radicals? It's on advertisements all over the place. Get your antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, blueberries, pomegranate juice, all of these things that are said to have high antioxidants. Um, what they'll do, so here down in the picture, we have this little green atom. This is the, an atom that's within an antioxidant. It has the ability to readily give up one of its electrons to um, satisfy that free radical. So it's gonna no longer go around trying to uh, steal electrons away from stable molecules like proteins and DNA and um, sugars and fats and stuff that could cause damage to your cells. So how do, uh, where do we get these antioxidants? Uh, food, right? So you probably have seen these and you know, your dark leafy green vegetables, broccoli, spinach, avocados, nuts, blueberries, dark chocolate, ginger, garlic, all of these things have high levels of these antioxidant uh, atoms that are freely will give up their electrons to these free radicals so they don't do as much damage as they normally would. Okay, so let's take a look at that last kind of bond, which is truly just an attraction, not a true strong bond. Um, so let's take a look at water. So we just talked about how water is a polar molecule because of those polar covalent bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen. So then what you end up with, water kind of looks like Mickey Mouse when you draw it all big and kind of with those uh, filled in shapes. So the hydrogen ends are positively charged. The oxygen sides of the molecule are negatively charged. And what do we say about opposite charges? They attract, that's right. So if we take a look here, I'll just draw an arrow right to this guy. These dotted lines represent hydrogen bonds. And so what we're seeing is the um, positive charge of the hydrogen is attracted to the negative charge of the oxygen. Um, so that it forms a little attraction. It's not super strong. It's a pretty weak bond all by itself. But when you have lots of hydrogen bonds together, it actually can make a pretty strong connection. I like to think of it as like Velcro. So if you have Velcro as like a hook and a loop, right? I kind of go in my, it's like this, right? So you have one, it's easily breakable because you got one little hook and one little loop like this, right? But think of a big sheet of Velcro and it can hold stuff pretty well, right? It can hold your shoes on. It can hold, you know, people who fly up to them, those Velcro walls. It can withstand the weight of your whole body. So think of hydrogen bonds that way. So a single hydrogen bond isn't very strong, but a whole bunch of hydrogen bonds are strong. And that gives some of these unique properties to water that we're going to be taking a look at, right? So our introductory picture with the ice skater and the water walking lizard, these hydrogen bonds account for some of those unique properties of water. Okay, so uh, water is the key of life. Without water, it does not exist. And that's one of the reasons why we haven't found life anywhere else in our extraterrestrial search is there's no liquid water out there. So life as we know it requires liquid water to survive. So in our planets within our solar system and exoplanets and you know the distant places that uh, astronomers are searching for, no liquid water has been found. There's been frozen water, but life really can't exist with frozen water either. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these important properties. 
So because of that polar nature of the molecule, we can say waters are, water molecules are kind of sticky. They can stick to each other and they can stick to other things. So we have some special words for those, uh, that ability. So when water molecules are sticking to each other via hydrogen bonds, this is a word we call cohesion. This guy right here, so cohesion. When water molecules are sticky to something else that's polar, so something else that, that's not water, this is what we call adhesion. So again, co is kind of like sharing or the same. Um, ad, A is kind of opposite. So cohesion and adhesion. I've given the example of how trees bring water. Trees are hundreds of feet tall. How do they get water from the ground all the way up to the very top of the top leaf without any kind of pump? They don't have a circulatory system. So what happens? Well, water comes in via the roots, right? So it's attracted to the inside of the cell. And at the top of the tree, it, water evaporates. There's little holes in the bottoms of leaves. And so water evaporates. And so it's like a, a, a big straw. So the environment is pulling the water up through the atmosphere is dry. And so water wants to go into the dry atmosphere. So it pulls it up, my hand, it pulls it up um, through the little tubes. There's like little tubes inside of the, the stems and the trunks of trees and plants. So what we see here is we have adhesion, where here we have the negative charge of the um, oxygen is attracted to the positive charge of the side of the cell wall within the tree. And then we have cohesion, right? So here's adhesion, is water is sticky to something else. And then here we have cohesion, where water is sticky to itself. So as we get evaporation happening out of the top leaves, um, those water molecules get drawn up out of the soil. And so that's how trees get water all the way up to the very top is because of that hydrogen bonds, that attraction between the partial positive and partial negative charges um, of the water molecule. So adhesion and cohesion are very important uh, in nature. Um, another characteristic due to that cohesion, a very specific type of cohesion is called surface tension. So surface tension is the tendency of water at the surface. You kind of get this film of just water molecules. Imagine like a net of all the water molecules held together by those hydrogen bonds. Um, and it resists being broken. Those hydrogen bonds, again, we get a whole bunch of them. They can be kind of strong. So in this picture, we have um, a paper clip sitting on top of a water. And we have, probably you are familiar with the water striders, but this looks like an actual spider. Um, sitting on top of the water, they're not breaking through is because their weight um, is not strong enough to break that film of water molecules held together by hydrogen bonds. In the uh, this week's lesson, there will be a video link um, dealing with uh, cohesion and surface tension. It's an astronaut in space bringing out a washcloth. One of the best YouTube science videos. Um, I love it. It's my best representation of hydrogen bonds um, surface tension and cohesion. So I highly recommend you watch that. It goes along with this topic right here, those sticky water molecules. Okay, another characteristic of water because of that polar nature, because of those uh, polar covalent bonds is water makes a great solvent. So a solvent is something that dissolves something else. So water is a solvent and then the substance that it dissolves are called solutes. That could be salt um, or sugar or um, dirt or grime or, you know, whatever you can dissolve with water. Just think about, you know, running water over something, it's going to dissolve away. So um, that's one of this, the great characteristics. Sometimes water is called the universal solvent because it can dissolve almost everything. Not everything. There's some things that water doesn't mix with, right? Oils, fats, we're going to see that in the next chapter. Um, so here in this picture, we're seeing the um, sodium chloride, which was made from our ionic bonds, right? Our sodium positively charged sodium ions and our negatively charged chlorine uh, ions. So if you take a look, um, your chlorine is negatively charged, right? So I'm going to go right here. This is a negative charge. And look how those water molecules are oriented around that negatively charged um, ion. Remember, hydrogen are the little white parts of the water molecule. Hydrogen part is positively charged. So if we take a look at the chlorine, all of these positively charged hydrogens are attracted towards the negative part of the chlorine. Okay, so that water molecule envelops the chlorine ion and rips it apart from the sodium. And take a look at the sodium. Sodium is positively charged. And look at how the water molecules are oriented 
around there. So the negative side of the water is attracted to the positive uh, charge on that sodium ion. So it's gonna rip that apart. So when you make salt water, right? So you get a sore throat, you do your gurgling or whatever you make salt water for, that's actually what's happening when you, you know, put the salt um, in your water, water is ripping apart that um, sodium chloride into individual sodium ions and chlorine ions. Okay, so here's my little joke. Oh, my head's cutting it off. Um, the polar bear says, help, help, I'm dissolving. And the grizzly bear says, bears are insoluble. And the polar bear says, that's easy for you to say, you're not polar. Get it? A polar bear, he's polar, so he can be dissolved by water. It's pretty funny. You'll have to go back and look at it without my talking head on there. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, not only can water interact with ionic bonds like sodium chloride and kind of rip those apart, it can uh, interact with other things that are held together by um, covalent bonds, but other uh, things that are held together by polar covalent bonds. So here uh, on this picture, we have uh, glucose, which is a carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen combination. But because we have some uh, non, sorry, some polar covalent bonds between oxygen and hydrogen, just like we had in water, we have that here. Um, we have some polar properties to the glucose. And so just like sugar water, right? So if you're making sugar water, like for the hummingbird feeder that I have out on my back porch, that you pour the sugar into the water, it dissolves. Well, why does it dissolve? Because the polar nature of the water rips apart the molecule of sugar because it also is polar. So water is a great solvent for other polar things. And these other polar things have a special word called hydrophilic. So hydrophilic means water loving. So they like to interact with water and they can do that because they're polar. They have to be polar for them to be hydrophilic. Now, what about the things that water cannot dissolve? What about things that are nonpolar, that have equal sharing of those electrons? Well, those are mostly fats and waxes and lipids. Um, so we have a special term for that. It's called hydrophobic. So water fearing, if you will, looking at those word roots. So things like oil, so here's oil and water don't mix, kind of in this picture. And leaves have a waxy covering. So if you've ever seen kind of dew drops kind of just beading up, or if you just freshly waxed your car, the water beads up on it is because waxes and oils are hydrophobic, is they don't have anything polar for the water molecules to attract to. And so they repel that polar water molecule because they are nonpolar. So that's called hydrophobic. Okay, so another uh, great characteristic of water, thanks to these hydrogen bonds, is water helps to stabilize temperature. So because those hydrogen bonds, there's a whole bunch of them, remember they're weak individually, but when you have a whole bunch, they're pretty strong. They can actually um, take up a lot of heat before the temperature of the water changes too significantly. Um, and so that's why uh, ch big changes in temperature can actually be pretty dangerous to you, even though we can resist a lot of that change because we're mostly water, but like a fever can affect your enzymes, hypothermia can damage your tissues. Um, so luckily we don't succumb to these things very often because we have this stabilizing um, watery environment inside. So we're about 50 to 60% water um, in our body and in our cells. So when we talk about temperature, temperature is basically the measurement of um, molecular movement. So how fast things are moving around. So if things are moving really slow, that's going to be lower temperature, like on the blue side, those little green circles aren't going very fast. And so if you stick a thermometer in there, it's going to have a lower reading. When you increase energy input into the system, the molecules, the atoms are moving really, really fast you stick a thermometer in there, you're gonna have a higher temperature reading. So temperature is the measurement of this moving energy. It's called kinetic energy. Now, because water has all of those hydrogen bonds, it takes a lot of energy to increase the temperature of water. So it requires one calorie of energy, which is a measurement, a unit of energy, to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. So that whole definition is what we call specific heat. Um, so that's a pretty big number compared to other things. I don't have other things to compare it to, um, but for the size of the water molecule, um, specific uh, heat of one is 
uh, pretty large energy input to change the overall temperature of water. So what does that mean? So, you know, have you ever boiled water before? You put the water in the pot, you put it on the pot, and then what do you do? You got to wait. You got to wait. You got to have a lot of energy going into that pot of water before it starts to boil, before it goes from the liquid watery phase to the gaseous steam and vapor phase. So this graph over here on the left is kind of showing you that energy input. So we have liquid water kind of at point C, right? Um, at so zero degrees and from zero to 100, it's still liquid water. It's the, the liquidy component. But here we have point D and this is energy. Joules is a form of energy, kind of like calories. So we from point D right here to point E, this is where we go from liquid, liquid water, to steam. Now we have to inc we have to put that much energy into the liquid water before we get to the steam. Well, what's going on? Well, remember those hydrogen bonds? A whole bunch of them together are pretty strong. So you got to put in energy, put in energy, put in energy, because what we're trying to do is make those molecules move around so fast that we're going to break free. Those water molecules will break free from the hydrogen bonds. When they do that, they can bounce off out in the atmosphere, and that's your steam. That's the change of from a liquid water to a vapor, to a gaseous water. That's huge. It's like 580 something. I can't remember if it's joules or kilocalories. It's a huge number compared to other molecules that don't do hydrogen bonds. So think of like alcohol as a, a, another small uh, organic molecule. You put alcohol or you spill alcohol, it evaporates very quickly. You spill water, it doesn't evaporate as quickly because it takes a lot of energy inputted into that pool of water to change from the liquid state to the gaseous state. Whereas in alcohol, it's got a very low specific, uh, low specific heat um, of vaporization. And so it'll, it's gone. It goes up into the atmosphere with hardly any energy input. So the reason why this is important for us is because when we are hot, um, the, when we sweat, our water can t hold on to a lot of that heat. And then when the wind comes by and blows that sweat off of us and evaporates it, it takes that heat away. And that's part of our homeostasis, right? We introduced that word last time to help us regulate our body temperature. Okay. So because we are mostly water, we can lay out in the sun for a, a relatively long period of time. Obviously, you don't want to sit out there cooking. Um, but it, our body temperature stays pretty normal within that homeostatic range, right around 98.6, even though we're taking on a whole lot of um, sun and heat energy, um, our overall body temperature doesn't increase because that water inside of our body can absorb a lot of that heat um, be, due to those hydrogen bonds. Okay, um, another unique characteristic about water, thanks to these hydrogen bonds, is the solid form of this matter, this water, is less dense. It's lighter than the liquid form. That's usually not the case. You'd think of a solid as things are more compact and tightly bound together. They're, they're solid, and so they're going to have a higher density and be able to be <clears throat> more weighty, more dense than their liquid counterpart. Water is different. When you're in the liquid state, kind of this one here on the picture on the left, when you're in the liquid state, the molecules can actually be a little bit closer together. So when we talk about density, it's volume over, sorry, mass over volume. So you can get more water molecules in a particular volume when you're in the liquid state. When it crystallizes into ice, take a look at that picture on the right, the hydrogen bonds, everybody's kind of sticking out their hydrogen bonds, and it physically moves those water molecules a little bit further apart from each other. So in the same volume where we could get a whole lot of liquidy molecules, all this, they're just kind of rubbing around on each other, kind of getting really close. When we get into the ice state, they kind of spread out a little bit. So in that same volume, you have less water molecules. You have less mass per volume, less dense. So solid water floats on top of liquid water, which is just crazy. Um, so here for a biological connection, ponds and lakes freeze from the top down and it never freezes completely to the bottom. There might be some small ponds and stuff that might do that, but usually you're not going to freeze all the way to the bottom. And so that's where some plants and fish can survive over winter um, is they're actually insulated by that, the ice that freezes from the top because the heavier ice, uh, sorry, the lighter ice moves to the top and the heavy water stays on the bottom. Okay.
The last topic for chapter two is taking a look at um, the idea of acids and bases and neutral um, solutions. So you've probably heard of acids and bases just in kind of common knowledge um, out there. So what we have here is this description of water and how it actually goes back and forth between the water molecule and ions. So um, what actually happens is those shared electrons, remember they share those electrons, but oxygen was a little bit more greedy. So what can actually happen sometimes is one of the hydrogens pops off, but it leaves its electron behind. So it's really just the proton, that H plus hydrogen ion floating around. And then the hydroxide, what's called the hydroxide ion is the OH, so the oxygen and the remaining hydrogen and that electron that got left behind by the other hydrogen. And so it is OH negative. And a, OH, and a hydrogen positive. So these back and forth arrows is what we call equilibrium. So it's, it's going back and forth equally. If you have um, equal concentrations of water, hydroxide and hydrogen ions, it's gonna be um, balanced. When you have solutions where you have either more hydrogen ions or more hydroxide ions, this is where we get acids and bases. So let's take a look at those definitions. For an acid, Acids are what we call proton donors, or they can give off a hydrogen ion. So that's gonna throw off that balance a little bit. You're gonna have more H pluses than you are hydroxides, more than the OH negative. So you're gonna, you'll have your water and every, all the OHs will be tied up with free hydrogen ions, but then you'll have some leftover, excuse me, hydrogen ions. So these are what we call acids. And you can see where the hydrogen ions are greater than the hydroxide ions. So any substance that releases hydrogen when they're dissolved in water are going to be acids. So hydrochloric acid is a very common one. That's in our stomach. That's our stomach acid, helps us with digestion. We can take a look at the HCl, it's an ionic compound. So when hydrochloric acid goes into water, it breaks apart, releasing hydrogen ions. So here I've given you a picture of some Kind of household items that you might be seeing around that are considered acids. So when you mix these with water, they will give off hydrogen ions and increase that concentration in whatever solution that you've just made. On the flip side to that, if you have a solution where you have more hydroxides than hydrogen ions, so you have um, all the hydrogen ions are bound up and you still have extra hydroxides, the OH minuses, then this is what we call a base. Um, so bases are proton donors, substances that can tie up or hold on to hydrogen ions or conversely put, on ex put out excess OHs um, because an OH minus can always tie up hydrogen ions. Um, so the example we give here is sodium hydroxide. This is another ionic compound that Na plus is attracted to the N uh, OH negative. So that OH negative, that hydroxide will go around and tie up any free floating hydrogen uh, reducing that concentration of hydrogen ions. So this is what we call a base. So again, here's a picture of some household items that would be basic when you mix them uh, in solution. Okay, so here's what we call the pH scale. And again, my head's cutting off kind of the top uh, level of it, but you have a pH scale in your book, um, figure 214, page 30 in the new edition. So when we have, so we talked about when we have more hydrogens, um, this is what we call an acid. So that's this guy right over here. If we have less hydrogens, that's a base. What about when they're the same? What do we have when the hydrogen ions are equal to the hydroxide ions? This is what we call neutral. So pure water, just water when you have that equilibrium with the water molecules going back and forth between the hydroxide and hydrogen ions, that's a neutral um, solution. pH seven, so there's a pH scale that goes from zero to 14 right smack dab in the middle, that's seven, pure water. Anything where you have more hydrogen ions, that's gonna take you to the lower level of these numbers. So between zero and 6.99 or whatever, those are gonna be acids. Anything greater than seven, so 7.1 or whatever, up to 14, these are called bases. And so this is just a relative kind of scale. Um, so you can easily compare the hydrogen ion concentration of different things. So some of the examples we see pure water is pH seven, blood is a little bit alkaline at 7.4, ocean water is about 7.8 to eight, uh, baking soda is about 8.4, all the way up to uh, oven cleaner is like 13. That's a very strong base. On the flip side, coffee is about five. So it's a little bit on the acidic side. Um, 
tomatoes, oranges, cola, about three. So those are pretty acidic. That's why it's not good to drink soda because um, the acids can uh, hurt your enamel on your teeth. Uh, our hydrochloric acid in our stomach is a pH of two. So very acidic helps with our digestion. Okay, and then the last thing is, well, since we have all these acids everywhere, um, how come we're not sizzling up in a big gooey pile of acids and bases? Well, in our body, we have these things called buffers. So a buffer is something that can act as both acid and base. It can release hydrogen ions if it needs to. It can tie up hydrogen ions as it needs to. So basically, it's a homeostasis maker. Um, whatever the normal pH is supposed to be, it has the ability to maintain that normal pH. Um, so the major buffer that we have in our blood is called the bicarbonate buffer. And you can see it actually involves water and carbon dioxide. There's a weak acid and a bicarbonate ion, the HCO3. Should have a negative right here. Doot. Um, so that bicarbonate ion. So that bicarb can actually tie up hydrogen ions. Um, we can run that equation in the reverse and exhale that carbon dioxide with our respiratory system, and that helps to release some of those any excess hydrogen ions if we're in an acidic condition. If we're in an alkaline or a basic condition, we can run the equation to the right, producing more of those hydrogen ions. So that's what makes it a buffer, is it can go both ways. It can produce hydrogen ions or um, hydroxide, or in this case, bicarbonate ions, um, when needed. All right, so I think that finishes up um, the lecture for chapter two. I uh, suggest you go back through but, uh, after the lecture, read to the book, make sure you watch that astronaut washcloth video. That's a great example of surface tension and cohesion. And I will see you next time. Bye.